fantastic nurse practitioner named right. Jennifer Savage, who was the, the queen of cardio. And, uh, but we also had Oscar Roth, who was a, uh, the head of cardiology at St. Raphael's and they kind of tag teamed. But most of the actual instruction was done by physicians. Yeah, and you know, the, the difference between what you and I went through in the 70s and what these kids go through now is we had physiology hammered into us in terms of what was going on, what was the normal physiology, what was the pathophysiology you were encountering in a given situation, and how do you counteract that? And yes, you can go by now, thank you. <laughs> um, and... Uh, uh, when I started teaching a lot of paramedics, I just took that all with me and said, look, if you guys understand physiology and pathophysiology, you're going to understand exactly why you're giving a particular drug and what to expect when you give it. And it's, it's paid off for a lot of them. But now I see these kids um, go through a training center, take a state exam or take the national registry, and they're out on the street as a paramedic. Mm. Um, I went through almost a thousand hours of field internship after I finished my training because the way we, our field internship was set up was you had to have a certain number of different types of events mm -hmm. that you were the medic on being observed by your preceptor and until you finished that checklist they didn't let you go out on your own uh, and today it's a much more rapid process yeah, we were very similar, you know, so, so many drug orders, so many codes, so many, yep. um, so many lines, uh, tubes, yep. you know, they were, they were, they were protocol, you know. Yeah. And yeah. And, and what I see, because I do medical legal expert witness work, mm -hmm. um, I see way too many instances where young medics are put in a situation, they screw it up because they really didn't understand what was going on from a physiology and pathophysiology standpoint. Um, they didn't recognize when a patient was circling the drain or what to do about it or when to stop playing and get the patient to a doctor in a hurry. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's sad. It's sad. I, I think we've lost something in that respect. Uh, mm -hmm. But, oh well. Yeah, when my daughter was in, in medical school, I used to hammer her with indications and contraindications and things like that. And then... Yep. She ended up with a list of meds longer than I ever dreamed of. So it sure. lost me sure. in the pharmacology, but yep. she'll still call me. I'd say before, she'll call, still call me at three o'clock in the morning to talk about a call or something. And, you know, yeah. oh, I just lost my video again. I got to, I got to, I, I can't be touching the, um, but you still got me? Yeah. yeah, you're on. Yeah, we've got you. That's weird. I got to touch. Not Every time I touch the mouse, I lose something, you know, come on. Put the mouse down, put the mouse down. I know. Drop the mouse. <laughs> hey, I was all excited this week. It turns out they're bringing back the Animaniacs with new episodes. Oh, really? Oh, the anim they were fan that was a fantastic car. I think we all need cartoons for a while. We've seen enough. Um, we've seen enough TV. Where yeah. am I? I need PG in the brain back because it makes so many references in dance class. Hey, what are we what are we gonna do tonight, Vladimir? I don't know, Donald. Try to take over the world. Is that how it goes? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And when I say that to the kids, they have no idea what I'm talking about. They think I'm crazy. There was that period of the in the 80s. Why am I not getting my video back? Oh, come on. Alt tab, see what happens. Hmm. Alt tab, see what happens. Okay. I gotta find it. That's weird, because last time I just clicked and I got it back. Still with me? We're with you. That's yep. weird. You're still with us. I don't have any. I don't see anything in my taskbar or anything that indicates that it's real. No. Great. I mean, we can do it without it, but you'll probably find me looking at my toes or something because I'm not paying attention. Don't pick your nose. No, nah, please, God, no. Now you go to the movies. You can pick your own seat. 
That is so strange. No, that didn't work. Whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on. Come on. At least I'm back in the, um, it's weird. Now I got the, at least the meeting um, invitation up. Hang on. Weird. Great. It's always right before we're going to start. Chat? No. Home? Return to meeting. How's that? Oh, there we go. Okay. Hey. Don't let me touch anything. I'm technologically, I'm not technologically challenged. I just do, you know, technology doesn't like me. I love technology. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Sit on your hands. That's it. It's all right. The amount of technological glitches with this whole program has been mm -hmm. entertaining. Between jumpy internet and lights. And mm -hmm. I adopted every piece of technology they threw at me, especially anything with spell check. Yeah. You know, when you've spent your life trying to figure out how to spell diarrhea and never get it right. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, they kept those little squiggly red lines. Yeah. Oh, geez. Yeah. Especially generic meds. You know, God. Yeah. Right. I think that's where I would get lost between the blood and guts and the pharmacology. Mm. All right. See you there. We're good. We're in good shape. 425. T, T minus five minutes and counting. You know? T minus five. A lot of gears turning in that head. What's your um, recovery prognosis? Um, it's hard to say. You know, um, last time they did the, when I did the right hip eight years ago, it was the second week in May. I was back on the car um, the third, second week in July, but I was eight years younger. It was fantastic. I mean, you know, and they claim that what they do now is less invasive and there's a better recovery time. So, you know, I'm hoping to be back at my Yale job by Christmas. You know, which will help them because they'll be. That'd be crazy. Yeah, I mean, well, that's a sitting down job though. So. Well, How's but still, I mean, you have to get out yeah. of the house. Which is that's it. You know, so that's that's kind of a goal is to make it. Um, you know, say this the second week in December, and it's realistic. Cool. Okay. You know, maybe they'll start with with half days. You know, so yeah. I'm not sitting in the same seat too long, but you know, they'll have PT. Yeah. Every orthopedic group has their PT group. As you walk in the door, you can hear the cash register ring. And um, yeah, they all have their own folks. Damn, that's a nice mailbox I've got. I'm just looking out the window. Excellent. Right. Look at that. Now you always do get mail. <laughs> Meaningful mail, rather. You know, well, so and I also just got pavers done for the driveway. My driveway is now about 50% wider than it was oh, wow. uh, in the lower part. So that we can get more cars in here. And I also had them do the front walk and the lanai. So I've had contractors here for over a week. Um, and unfortunately, I did things in the wrong order. I had the lawn and the landscaping done about two months ago. Ah. I should have waited until the guys that did the paver left because they had heavy equipment back and forth into oh, my backyard oh. for the entire week. Mm -hmm. So it's a mess, but oh well, that too shall pass. And just pray for snow. You get, that first, you get that first good that's snow, it covers snow. up all the damage and uh, you worry about it in the spring. Yep, yeah. Uh, that's always the uh, last leaves that I never got to. I just wait for snow and say, they're not there now. Yeah. Yeah, settings. Uh, let's see. touch up my appearance that isn't going to do me any good at all um i gotta figure out how to zoom i don't know how 
Right. Never mind. No idea. There must be a way to do it, and I have no idea how to do it, so screw it. Not important. We are, what, about three minutes? About a minute. Okay. No, we're about one minute. I've got 429. I just here. consulted my sand, sand dial. Mm -hmm. Counting down. Christy is looking anxiously at the screen, trying to count down here. Um, um, I don't know if we went through it last time, um, but there's like a 10 second delay. So we'll kind of count in here and then you have to hold for 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. Okay. Um, <laughs> otherwise, we end up with a really weird uh, preview. Yep. Pictures. All right. So start your silent countdown. Big smile. Pushing the button. Okay. And are we live? Okay. Yes, we are. We are live on Facebook. Yeah, live right. on Facebook. All right. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. We finally got Clark in the guest chair and live streaming to you today on a Saturday. We're so excited for this special edition. Uh, you probably caught the preview, uh, was it last week, week before? Um, so we'll dive into some more Connecticut history here. We've been regaled with the tales and excited to share with you all. So um, I will let Doc take it away here and uh, catch y'all on the other side. Okay, thanks, Christy. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we are delighted to have Clark Herbert with us. Um, Clark is from the New Haven, Connecticut area, and I'm going to let him tell a little bit about his background. So for the most part this afternoon, I'm going to be listening. <laughs> Clark's going to be talking, and we're going to try and bring things up to speed. The one thing that I will say is notable about where uh, Clark worked for his EMS career was that he was near Yale, New Haven, the Yale New Haven Medical Center, and they have had and still have an outstanding paramedic training program of which Carl was uh, one of the early folks uh, like myself. We would horse-drawn carts and uh, wooden wagons and so forth. So Clark, why don't you give us a little background on how you got into EMS and where that took you, please? Sure, Doc, no problem. Um, I grew up in the fire service. My dad was a uh, career firefighter. Uh, my brother was a career firefighter. My dad actually worked in EMS in the early 50s for uh, commercial ambulance services in New Haven and Hamden, Connecticut. Um, I've got pictures of him schlepping a Ferno cot with a, probably a 53 caddy. So it's, it's a family business. You know, my, my daughter... Um, is a medic working out in North Carolina and uh, knows a lot more than I do, believe me. So um, I joined the volunteer fire department at 16, did my first EMS call and I was kind of hooked after that. Um, I went to college for fire protection in Oklahoma State. Um, we lived in the firehouse and rode the rigs. Um, the more calls you did, the happier you were. Uh, we were required to ha take a phys ed course of some sort or another and I wasn't about to do anything that was physically challenging. And one of the courses was EMT which was a uh, you know, two semester course. But when we finished it, um, we'd have our card for Oklahoma and we could ride the, ride the ambulance that ran out of our firehouse. It was a, uh, I'm not sure the manufacturer, but it was a Pontiac at the time and their headquarters, they had a Suburban, which we all loved it. But uh, the Pontiac was cool because you could get on the Oklahoma highways and do a hundred without even thinking about it. Um, and when I get back from, when I graduated, I got back from Oklahoma, I worked up. I started working commercial in New Haven at uh, the Great Great Flanagan Ambulance. Uh, the first commercial service in New England, probably the first commercial service in the, maybe one of the first commercial services in the country. And we'll get into that a little bit. In 1980, 
I was hired by the town of Hamden, Connecticut, and uh, they sent me to medic school. So I uh, went to medic school in 1980. We were the third class out of, out of Yale New Haven Hospital um, and also St. Raphael's Hospital, which was the second um, hospital in New Haven at the time. It's since been taken over by Yale as many things were taken over as we know with EMS. Um, and then uh, I did 30, 30 years in Hamden, uh, another seven years in the Naugatuck River Valley working for the city of Ansonia and finally found myself doing 12 hour shifts with 22 year olds and uh, backed it off a tad. And here we are. How would you contrast your medic training in 1980 um, to what kids are doing today to become paramedics and function on the street? No, well, we had an, an accelerated program and it was more accelerated than anything else because we had so few medics in the field, they really needed to get us going. Uh, there was an emphasis on, uh, I would say, a well, uh, cause and effect. Okay, now you're gonna give this med and you don't have a lot of them. So you're gonna give this drug, what's it gonna do and why? And when shouldn't you do it? There were a lot of indication, contraindication training, a lot of uh, anatomy, physiology, and how it, how it was affected by the pharmacology and, and things like that. So it, it gave us a good, I think we had a great background in what we were doing and why, you know, what doesn't belong and why, so to speak. The kids today are more protocol driven where, you know, they used to accuse us of giving the blue box and the red box, but I think they're doing that more now than we did before. And, uh, you know, the, the life back 15s are wonderful things, but it may tell you a little bit too much about what's going on without seeing what's happening with the patient around you. Yep. But the, the kids in the field are, are doing excellent work. As I say, they have so much more they can do now with pacing and, uh, you know, real, real tubes instead of EOLs. Although when I finished, we had tubes, but um, things like that, that I praise them 100%. Yeah, but you know, what's interesting, um, when you were taught to intubate, um, did you get the opportunity to go into an operating room in the morning with the anesthesiologist and drop tubes? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's almost non-existent these days because the hospitals are so concerned about liability. Oh, we that's learned a really lot. sad. We uh, learned a lot, including what music each surgeon likes, and uh, they all yep. had their own way of doing things. It, it was really an educational experience yep. in more yep. ways than one. So. Um, Go back to when you started as a medic on the street. Contrast that to what you see now in terms of what these kids are doing. I know you mentioned that they can do more than we did because of a lot of devices and equipment that have been invented um, over the last 40 years. But um, what, how do you contrast what we did, what you and I did, in 1980 versus what these kids are doing today? No, um, they say they do a lot more. We worked with what we had and I think we did a good job there. We had to um, call in for a lot more med orders. Our protocols were very limited, uh, what we had for standing orders. Um, and occasionally we'd butt heads over Trump. When we knew we needed a med order and we couldn't get it, especially in the first two weeks in July, yep. when we were dealing with the brand new, um, they would always put the brand new residents on the radio and uh, yeah. as their learning experience. Um, yeah. But you know, it, it, everything was new that we had issues with docs with especially primary care physicians in the field that did not particularly want us and didn't understand the program. Obviously they had never watched emergency in the seventies. And um, we were given, a, our, our medical director, Bill Frazier actually gave us a paper to give to a primary care physician, basically saying, if you wanna take over um, on this call, you have to write in with the crew. And most of them would read it. They would recognize his name and go, oh, no, no, you guys are okay. You know, just don't overdo it. You know, no, we're not going to overdo it. We're going to save your patient for you. Yeah. You yeah. know, and uh, so yeah, you and I had, yeah, you and I had the same experience. We had a, a, a speech that we used to give. The doctor mm -hmm. decided to stick his nose in. We'd say, okay, here's the deal. And you have now assumed full responsibility for this patient. Yeah. And when you said that to them, that usually had them put the brakes on in a big hurry. Yeah, especially if it was when the neighbor, the neighborhood podiatrist that um had, hadn't seen a heart monitor in forty years, but he's a doctor. Mm -hmm. And but yep. So I mean, they say the kids. I think they, they're working in an environment where they're much more accepted. Yeah. Than we were. Um, we would go to a hospital that didn't. There were still hospitals that didn't have ALS in their yeah. area, 
and we would end up uh, transporting to one of those hospitals and the, the old ER nurses were like shocked. Who gave you permission to start that line? What's well, my protocols? Well, can I see him? I said, well, no, <laughs> you know, but yeah. here, call our medical director. He's on this paper. Yeah. Yeah. And there, there, but it, it took a while to become accepted. And once we were though, we worked hand in hand with a lot of really good yeah. staff. Were you ever hospital based? Um, I was I was never hospital based. My, yeah. my daughter is now, but we did on in Connecticut. Um, no, when, when everything's first started, Norwalk had a hospital based service. Yeah. Um, and that was about it. Everything else was either municipal, mostly fire, or or commercial. Yeah. yeah. Um, any memorable cases you worked over the years that stick out in your mind? Well. Um, my first call, but we, we talked about that before. Um, the first EMS call I ever did, I was in the back of a fire engine. It was a gentleman that was uh, stuck in a vacuum cleaner hose. And I don't think we'll get into details, but no, I saw that and I said, wow, this is cool. You know, I want to keep this G like this. I want to keep it G rated. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, well, you know, like um, memorable call uh, when I was precepting, my brother um, who was a medic uh, was playing golf with my dad. My dad started to have chest pains and he was having an MI. Of course, he brought him in. He took him in the car instead of calling an ambulance. Brought him to the firehouse. That was my first field IV, and uh, honestly, I was scared to death. But I got it on the first shot and um, rode in with him, and uh, that kind of set the tone because if I, I figured if I could do that, I could do anything. Um, yeah. I still, to this day, look with a little bit of disdain at motorcycles because I think those are probably always our worst. I think those are some of the worst traumas we've ever saw with bike accidents, with amputations, yeah. and uh, they were guy. pretty pretty grim. A lot of them. Oh, I know exactly. You probably like myself um, because of where I was working uh, with the really bad motorcycle accidents. What we were trying to do was keep the tissues viable till we could get them to the hospital, mm -hmm. so that they could be transplanted. Uh, that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's pretty sad. But uh, I don't know if you ever used the term donor cycle, but we did a lot yeah uh, and uh those were horrible that's and my my 25 year old son has a motorcycle and it scares the bejesus out of me to be honest with you um oh there's your cat there's there the siamese is. cat <laughs> mine went to lay down so she's out of the picture now uh, he has a tendency to step on just the wrong key on the keyboard so i'm gonna yeah, try yeah. very desperately to keep him off yeah. Well, Siamese cats think they're smarter than we are anyway, so it's it's all right. It may be uh, true. So uh, what so you started out on the street in 1980 mm -hmm. or thereabout. Mm -hmm. And what was the progression of positions and roles that you had from the standpoint of EMS and EMS education? No, it was interesting. You know, I, I you know, naturally we our services because we started out at the infancy. As we continued in EMS and ALS, we were constantly upgrading. You know, our intubation went from the EOA to ETs, um, yep. the added drugs. So there was it was always an educational process. Yeah. The, the issue with being um, in fire EMS is eventually you have to make a decision. Do you want to continue a career in the fire service, or do you want to stay with EMS? I was uh, a medic for fifteen a me, a medic for fifteen years. I've always been an EMT, and I had to make the decision whether I wanted to. Um, progress in the fire service. You know, you eventually you get promoted off the unit. Um, um, and that's what I ended up happening. I retired as, as a chief officer. Of course, my SUV had as much EMS equipment as most of the rescues. And I, yeah. I jumped a lot of calls and uh, did a lot of EMS on yeah. fire scenes and things like that. But that was, that was a tough decision to make. Um, when I finally decided to really step up the fire end was after 9-11, when I kind of, uh, got back into it with both feet. I, I took a lot of um, programs at Emmitsburg and things like that and um, was able to finish up a pretty good career. But I always worked um, part-time, even with fire. I, I, I always grabbed some part-time hours with the commercial that I worked for. And then um, when I retired, I said I went back, uh, back in EMS for the last yeah. seven years. Interesting observation, because I think uh, two really good friends of mine, Gary Ludwig, who's the immediate past president of IAFC, Mm -hmm. And David Downey, who just retired last year as chief of Miami-Dade Fire Rescue, both of them started out as paramedics. Yeah. But for vertical mobility purposes, 
they had to go up the <laughs> the fireside and there's your cat again nice cat tail by the way <laughs> but but yeah it's interesting where where it's fire ems a lot of times for the folks to really get significant vertical mobility vertical mobility they have to opt for the fireside um, to move up the food chain um, but a lot of them like the two i just mentioned really cut their teeth on the ems side and our, our emts and medics um would excel in the officer testing because yeah. we were still in school we were still always learning and uh, when it came to take the lieutenant captain's test or whatever the top the top uh finishers were always medics yeah because that was what we were still doing you know and uh, still test taking tests we, we yeah. had we had to research every year you know different types of testing as time went on so we were used to it you know? gave us a bit of an edge so you mentioned that you've retired um i don't believe it what are you doing right now relative to ems i, I can't believe re None of us retire when we've been doing this for a long time. No, there's no such thing. Um, actually, I'm, I'm working for Yale University, um, and they have a facility operations center where um, you basically take everything that happens in the university is that one number to call. And then we have to sort out what's going on with the person, whether they need a craftsperson, whether they need whatever. And we uh, we sort out the call. So I'm kind of like, it's kind of like being a dispatcher, only I haven't grown my horns and tail yet. Yeah. Um, but, and I stay, I stay with it. You know, I help Len Gersha, who's the head of uh, uh, training at Yale New Haven. I help him occasionally. I'll go in and help him uh, instruct and I'll still go in there and be a, I love being a, a patient, a mock patient. So you, you know, get a chance to do some mentoring in the process then. Absolutely. Well. Yeah. I like, yeah. it's nice working with the kids. Um, yep. I, uh, I have a 68 Cadillac ambulance. That's the clone of the first car I worked in. And we really enjoy taking it. Um, we were asked to go to volunteer ambulance corps and things like that and work with the kids and show them their history because most of them aren't even aware of it. They go, what's that? You know, and you, you hear a lot of Ghostbusters stuff. But And uh, as part of the training program, they come out and we pick the largest guy in the room, put him on the Ferno Model 30, and they have to lift them into the uh, in, into the caddy. And uh, that's a learning experience for them. Uh, yeah, that this? probably gets their that's attention, cool. doesn't it? <laughs> and that's and that's why we have bad backs and you probably won't because the next one, the next patient you're going to load is going to be with your power load yep. and be yep. prepared to marry it because you should love the damn thing you know yeah i you know i you and when i you and i talked the other day i've got bad l4 l5 problems i think anybody that did ems in the 70s and 80s for any extended period of time pays the price with their back um for sure yeah we, when we switch from the caddies to the trucks um, they didn't kneel like the trucks do today. So we went from lifting into yep. a two foot lift to a four foot lift. Yep. And it was, it was an adventure. And yep. God forbid you called for help. You know? Yeah. You were, you were no, on your own. no, there were times, you know, did you ever call for an engine company sometimes if the patient was big enough? Uh, yeah. Sometimes you have to. Yeah. We did that. Yeah. When we get them up around 400, 450, 500 pounds two guys aren't going to get that person in the ambulance safely. <laughs> we had a guy in a, in a fourth floor walk up, uh, a rented room. Oh. And he had gotten so large, we couldn't, he couldn't get through the door or down the stairs. So we actually had a ladder company come and we cut out the window, uh, a square around the window, big enough for a sheet of plywood. And we put him from the bed onto a sheet of plywood and wrote him down on the tower ladder. There you go. And it, it, it necessity was necessity the mother of invention, right? We, we pretty much stressed out the uh, weight requirements of the tower ladder as well, but you, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. Yeah. So your first call was memorable. Mm -hmm. What other ones stick in your mind? Well, like I say some of the bad, some of the bad traumas, um, some of the bad traumas you always think of. I have one gentleman that, oh, it still bothers me. Um, it was a back pain complained of back pain, you know, he said, ah, my back's bothering me and stuff like that. And I'm looking at him, his vitals were good. He insisted on walking out, out to this cot, out to the cot. We wheeled him into the ambulance, right? I'm, I'm taking vitals and he just crashed yep. and he, he dissected a triple A. Yeah. Totally unexpected. And um, yep. I was working um, for municipal service out on the shoreline in Connecticut. It was a, a two, it was a, an EMT car. You know, I was just working part-time. And so I had no tools you know, with me or anything like that. And it just, this guy crashed. I said, oh, okay, no blood pressure. 
no pulse. You know, he just went down. I was, I was talking yeah. to him. We were joking around. And that still bothers me. But there was, and I, I, I went, we spoke with the medical director. And he said, well, there's nothing you could do, you know, exactly. other than get, get your butt to the hospital. He was dead when he crashed, you know. Yeah. We yeah. called for an ALS intercept. But by that time, he was flat. He was flatlined. He was asystole. But How about we, babies? You ever deliver any babies? Well, a few, you know. In the, in, the, in the inner city, you know, you, you're in the bath. Most of the time you're in the bathroom and uh, find them in the, in the toilet a lot of times. But yeah, you know, the ones that are successful are, are, are great. Yeah. Much messier than they are on TV and in movies. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. You know, yeah. Always did our best to try to keep that child from being delivered until we got to the hospital. Yeah. Yeah. I delivered one on Christmas Eve one year. Well, that's great. And told my crew, go find me some red and green ribbon. And of course, at that time of the year where I was, you could find red and green ribbon. So I tied off the placenta side with red and I tied off the baby side with green. And we took the mother and the baby to the hospital. And the doc, who I knew really well, he said, OK, who the hell's the wise guy? And I said, that would be me. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Merry Christmas. <laughs> but um, yeah, there are some good times, too. Um, but I think in talking to in some of the stuff I do up here now, I think the bad trauma cases tend to stick uh, with a lot of medics that have been doing it for a long time. Um, particularly if in retrospect, they think maybe I should have done more or maybe I could have done something else. Um, and I know that's something that's always bothered me is looking back and saying, okay, what could I have done differently that would have saved this guy? But like your AAA that you mentioned, there's not a thing you could have done. No. Um, Let's say you do your best you can. You look at your scene times and say, did I, did I mess around too much? And yep. normally you're not, you know, and uh, that's when you look for feedback and yep. for, you know, and. Uh, so what do you see as your legacy? Um, now that you've been at this for a while and you're now one of the wise old men in EMS up in your part of the world, what do you see as your legacy, Clark? Um, it's a good thought. You know, I, I tried to be a mentor to the, to the kids I worked, worked with and um, I've continued to try to um, live and um, try to extend the memory and the history of EMS. Uh, every other year we have a, a reunion and we invite the kids on the field now, I always call them kids, I don't know why, but we invite the people sure. in the field now to go to our reunion and to get the older- Clark, at our age, they are all kids. What are you talking honestly, about? Honestly, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> but we try to get them to come to our reunions and uh, share and share experiences. And uh, they figure out after a while that we were we were the tough old guys that are, are you know walking around with our canes now and they, uh, they get a little more respect for us. And- uh, yeah. And mainly it was teaching them how we really did fly by the seat of our pants and still got the job done. And it wasn't yeah. all, you know, they always say, oh, you just threw them in the back of the car and took off. Well, it wasn't, it was, I don't think it was ever that case. In the history, we always did first aid to the, to the extent of what it was available. I don't think I ever worked for a service where we just uh, threw them in the back of the car. It was only on TV where a patient ever rode on a company that I think yeah. you know, there was always an attendant, at least in our area. Um, the other thing you mentioned, which is something, a, a term that I'll throw out now and then to youngsters in the business now. And I said, we came up in the era of, era of mother, may I paramedicine? Uh, we almost had to ask for everything that we had to do. And I know that that transition that, that went away over time, but I know that's how we started out that everything we wanted to do to a patient, we had to get a medical control person on board to say, yeah, go ahead and do that. Uh, they, they always wanted us to send IVs to the hospital, strips yeah. to the hospital. And they always, they had these very elaborate receiving um, mechanisms at the hospital. And uh, we had things that hooked up to our portables. We had a, the life pack for us had an acoustic um, device on top that you'd put a phone receiver on. No matter what we had, yeah, yeah. none of it ever worked. I don't think I ever yeah. successfully sent a strip to the hospital and they'd always ask for them. And I think they finally just got to the, uh, they finally just learned that if we're telling them we have something, we have something. We're not going to make yeah. it just to get a drug order. But that yeah, was the that, hardest that, part. Was that audible that. connect thing, that was oh. sort of a hoot. <laughs> the tech, the tech, the, the wish list far exceeded the technology. Yep. At time. So 
with all of that, um, what are you, tell me where you're at now in terms of what you see going on today with EMS and where you see this profession headed. Um, you know, the issue has always been um, commercialization. And um, right now we're seeing, you know, so many small, small services that really were able to give good customer service to their locals uh, being taken up by the big commercials to the point where eventually we'll see two or three big ambulance services that have the money to bid, bid municipal contracts and things like that. Um, pretty much running ALS, running the show. A lot of municipalities uh, that don't want to spend the money for the paramedic bumps for their guys and stuff like that are looking to contract out. And I think we're seeing more of that. Um, is it good or bad? It's, it's hard to say. Well, big service with money supply better service? No, I, I haven't seen that so far. I've seen more cuts and uh, when, you know, more cuts and crews, um, you know, in, in our area, the local big commercial will um, cut crews if it's a slow day. And all of a sudden there's a bus crash on I-95 and they've got three cars to send, you know, so that's, there's a, there's there's pros and cons, but I, I see more of it as a con with the commercialization, even though I cut my teeth in commercials and I believe in them hundred um, percent. The larger companies tend to become a little more impersonal towards the, uh, the patients than we did when we had smaller companies where they really meant something to us. Yeah. That comes yeah. Across it all is intelligent. Well, some of that was driven by Jack Stout's system status management um, mm -hmm. where services would take a look at what happened at different hours of the day. And they'd move people around, move units around, um, reduce crew, you know, reduce crews, say between 0100 and 0600, because the heart attacks most commonly were usually between 6 and 7.30 in the morning. Yep. Those were probably the most common times that we'd see those. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's kind of kind of fascinating to see, I, I think, and, and from the conversations I've had with some of those big commercials, I think their heart is in the right place. Um, I think they are driven by shareholders in many cases, which, uh, you know, the bottom line. Exactly. So That's exactly what I was thinking. When you said a that. very tough balance for them. Um, but so anyway, um anything else we've missed i know what we've missed tell me more about yale you hate new haven and how they got into what we do for a living that's the great story um back uh 1890 something a gentleman was born by the name of thomas joseph flanagan he was a son of irish immigrants from meriden connecticut and as with every big irish family they sent their best and their brightest to the priesthood. And Tom went to Niagara University in New York. Niagara was where you would send your, you know, one of the areas that sent the kids to seminary. Tom was a big Irish kid. He played basketball. He played um, different sports. Uh, he really wasn't going to be a priest, but he was brilliant. And um, one time at, when he was a junior, he had a very bad leg injury when he was playing basketball. They had to take him to Buffalo uh, for treatment. And the ride that he had to Buffalo in an alumni's um, vehicle was, was horrendous to him. And he began thinking then that there had to be a better way. Uh, he had heard about the um, ambulances at that time were basically for transportation. Um, New Haven Hospital, which was the before Yale affiliation, um, ran ambulances on a contract with the War Department during the Civil War, where they would um, bring soldiers from the battlefields into New Haven Harbor and load them onto horse-drawn ambulances and bring them to the hospital. And they had actually built wards at the hospital buy money from the war department to handle those soldiers. And so Tom decided that he wasn't gonna be a priest. His family wasn't happy. And he came to New Haven and got a job at New Haven Hospital as an ambulance driver. Um, at that point, they had just converted from horses to Model Ts. And I've seen, there's, I've got a picture of Tom with the other drivers. And the other drivers had their white coats on, had their hats perfectly straight. Tom's leaning out of the door of his ambulance with a big grin on his face. And the first thing I thought when I saw this picture was, he looks like one of us. 
I saw another picture of Tom in that same area. He's, he had to, he was uh, they didn't have heat in the ambulances. He had this big fur coat on, like the raccoon coats of the twenties, yep. with another that big grin. But Tom was convinced that he he could do it better, and he sold the management at New Haven Hospital on using ambulances to bring EMS into the field. Um, they gave him money to convert the cars and add equipment, whatever equipment was available in the day. And then he had to do training. He, the people he hired were allowed to audit classes at the Yale Med School. And they had classes alongside the, the physician students and alongside the med schools, everything, anatomy, physiology, all of that. So when these guys went in the field, they were better trained probably than anybody until EMT started. Um, they would go out on emergency calls with a, uh, the, the driver that had gone to the med school and a physician from the emergency department. And they were doing what we think of as ALS, as field ALS during the flu epidemic in 1918, where you would bring, we called it bringing the emergency room to the patient. They were actually doing that. Um, there was a, in 1921, there was a major loss of life fire in New Haven. It was at the Rialto Theater. Um, they were showing a, um, Rudolph Valentino's The Sheik and they were burning incense on the stage and it set the curtains on fire. And um, a, a gentleman, I don't remember the doctor's name. I have, the, I have his paper. He actually came from New York and wrote a paper on the treatment of the burn patients. And it was probably the first documentation of field treatment of burn patients by, by civilian personnel as opposed to at war. And they, they did, they, they, they did quite a job. I think they transported 40 or 50 um, burn patients to the, the three New Haven hospitals. But, and it grew from that. Um, they continued that sort of service until the doctor shortage of World War II dropped it back to EMTs or the equivalent EMTs, trained personnel in the cars. Meanwhile, a couple of years into the, into, the, um, into the service with New Haven Hospital, they didn't want to do transports anymore. They were so enamored with field EMS that they allowed Tom Flanagan to pay $2 for the use of the third, their third ambulance. So he could start his own commercial service and do, do all the transports and back them up. And basically he started a commercial, a commercial ambulance service in 1918 that continued um, into the eighties. And again, it was always there. I've got articles about him as, as things went on because I did a lot of research and I, I intended to write a book, never did, but, um, and it, all, all the articles that were written about him, um, were basically stressed on his training and the professionalism of his guys. They were never drivers, they were chauffeurs because there was no word for trained EMS person. Now, there wasn't even probably a word for EMS at the time. But from the stories I've read and the, the articles in the newspaper, they were very good, probably as good as the EMTs of our day were. And, um, you know, it was, uh, it's, a, it's a great story. Tom invented things. Tom invented the first multi-level amb level ambulance cot. Um, in 1926, I've got the patent on it. It was neat. It actually was better than the Furnos because it folded up as you rolled it into the back of the car, like the more modern cots do today. Yeah. And um, it was pretty interesting. Um, it, and when I started with Flanagan, we were very specific, and you may remember this as well. It was a cot. It wasn't a stretcher. You use the stretcher to carry the patients to the cot. And some of the photos I, I got from Yale, um, basically before that, what the patient was on the back of the ambulance was a cot with these little little short legs, and it looked like it looked like a cot, and that's where the name came from. You know, you, everything has a history, and yeah. they used to the old guys used to stress that it's not a stretch, it's not the stretcher, it's not a gurney, it's a cot, and it came from that. They replaced the wheeled ambulance uh, cots replaced the uh, ones with legs, and that was kind of cool. Um, He was, you know, he was, he used, when he started his service and it was successful, he was asked to go around the country and give speeches and give talks at different uh, conventions and things like that, medical, uh, on how do you start an ambulance service and how do you do the training? And he was well known. He was known around the country at the time. You know, he's now kind of gone into oblivion, but, uh, but again, he, he was really a pioneer. I always called him the grandfather of, of modern EMS because a lot of services started with him. You know, it's interesting as you go around the country, EMS is different from fire, from police, in that every area started a little differently. You know, when I was in the Midwest, uh, it was funeral homes in the South. Um, um, police yeah. were huge. Police were huge at the, at the advent of ambulance transportation and EMS because that's how it started. Uh, doctors would come to your house. Um, 
They, that's why they had unlimited gas rationing in wars. If they feel, felt you need to go to the hospital, they take you in their car or their buggy before that. If they needed to get you to the hospital, they couldn't do it, the police would come and help. That's why a lot of PDs were the first municipal ambulances. Um, Connecticut State Police ran ambulances out of the barracks back in the caddy days. Um, most yeah. municipal police departments had EMS before fire and ended up turning over the program. So it's interesting to see how it grew in that respect. But Tom Flanagan was our was our hero, you know, because uh, when we started, the old guys would tell us the stories and you know, we all got that oral history. I was lucky enough to retain it. Has anybody ever written a biography about him? No, honestly, I've, I've been gathering information for years, but I never really had the, um, probably the experience or the training in being an author, but why it could happen. Find, why don't you find yourself a ghostwriter and write this guy's biography? It's it's a great story. It really is because Sounds of like what it. came out of what he what he envisioned. It was his vision that started it. Now I was always especially um, enamored with the training because you know he, yeah. he had that thought. You know, hey, we got a, we got a med school here. Let's train the guys, and and they did. You know, his first three um, his first three employees, Andy Vets, um, Johnny Conti, and Art Fredericks, stayed with him until he sold the company in 1953. He had very loyal employees and. Um, some of the oral histories I got from uh, neighbors and things like that is these guys were heroes in their day. The kids would come and just hang around the ambulance garage and shine, do like they'd pay them a couple of, uh, you know, a dime to shine their shoes and things like that. But um, they, they were really well respected in the city, you know, in their day. It wasn't, you know, yeah, they were like special, so to speak, man. The material you've got on Tom Flanagan. Flanagan, is that the right? Did I get the name right? Flanagan? That's correct. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like an Irishman. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So is any of that such that we might be able to digitize it for the EMS Museum to enable people to do research on this guy down the road? You know, as I'm, I'm going to have a few weeks off when I, um, I've got, I've written down a lot. I've gotten written a lot. I wrote down all my oral histories and things and um, I'm having a hip replacement next week. So I will have some time off. And if you'd like, I can, um, I can certainly uh, put some things together. Photos, I've got tons you know, of uh, photos Excellent. of the years, newspaper articles and things like that. And it's all put together. It's just a matter of somebody with more intelligence than I that could actually make it into a sort of a book. But it's a, it's, it's a heck of a story. Well, this, that kind of stuff is our raison d'etre. That's why the National EMS Museum exists, is mm. so that we can preserve this kind of history for folks that are researching the history of where we came from, how we got here. Uh, I think of Rick Pamaka and Norm McSwain in the early 80s launching PHTLS no. um, and finally taking some of Norman coining the phrase kinematics of trauma. Nobody had any idea what the hell he was talking about in the beginning, but we finally understood it. Um, and it made a difference. And it's those kind of folks like this guy Flanagan that's the kind of history we need to preserve and let more people know about. Um, I just think of a few others that, that have crossed my paths in my lifetime. And, um, you know, we need, to, we need to preserve them as part of the history of emergency medical services in the United States. Yeah, these were true innovators in their day when, uh, because they were creating something from nothing. Um, another, yeah. another tool that Tom Flanagan had the, um, had the patent on was the uh, split apart pole stretcher. I don't even know. Um, they made a pole stretcher. He, he invented a pole stretcher based on the military unit. But in the middle, the, the um, I'm going to do my hands here. In the middle, the fabric went together like this. And yeah. they had a piece of fabric coated spring steel that held it together. So you'd carry the patient to the ambulance. You'd pull the pole so you can sit them right up straight. Uh, when you got to the hospital, you pulled the string. You could pull the uh, the whole thing out from under under the patient just by it was like a, like a like a canvas scoop. And the one Very thing cool. and, and the one thing you may agree with me on EMS today is they've they've lost a lot of their carrying equipment as far as getting the patient. If it's not a stair chair, they the kids are a little bit lost. And these are fantastic. You could you could stand somebody by crossing the poles at the bottom. You could basically stand somebody straight going down these. Uh, little narrow five, four, four walk-ups in New Haven. And uh, it, it amazes me, I, I'll tell you, it's, I'm, I'm amazed that nobody, else, nobody has reinvented this, that was, especially this, this, the one that splits apart because it was a fantastic tool. 
you know, maybe it's cool. too primitive for uh, today's use, but. Interesting. That's more that we need to learn more about as well. Um, I've, got, I've got the original patents, so I'll include that. Very in my... cool. Where is my director? Christy, where are you? Hello. There she is. There you are. Hi there. How I would you like to? You're taking notes. We're going to write. How would you notes. like to jump on that last conversation? Uh, no, I just want to do the project. So, uh, speedy recovery so we can get in on Tom Flanagan here. The early history of EMS is really what hooked me in my early days. Yeah. The museum is yeah. sheer innovation that happened from 1900 to 1930, 1940, it really was- Actually, the transition started with the Civil War. That's where a lot of the innovations started and then evolved after that. <clears throat> but if you look at Bellevue, if you look at New Haven Hospital, um, it was probably an offshoot of the military application of the Civil War medicine and ambulances in the Civil War, etc. cetera. Um, but now what else do we need to talk about while we're here, Christy? Did I miss anything? Uh, I don't know, this is, this is your coffee. I can sip in my coffee, but taking my notes. Um, no, I, I was going to save this for next weekend, but I'm just going to tease that uh, with some of our programming coming up in 2021, if there are any EMS historians sitting out there listening to these coffee sessions, start stewing about um, potential papers or presentations you may want to make and uh, reach out because we're gonna we're gonna do something really fun, really cool next year. Um, well, I was thinking along the lines of I was thinking along the lines of what in the TV you say, and now a word from our sponsor. Yeah. Um, I thought that there were a few things that we probably needed to mention to folks that um, we are doing or have upcoming. I think first of all, on November 15th, we have another pause and clause section session going on, which is a pet first aid course. And for those that took it before, I understand it was a lot of fun um, for both the pets and the people that participated. Um, we have a, uh, Fundraising effort going on. We, the, the ambulance that Clark mentioned, that's kind of a modern one. We've got a 1954 Packard that we have acquired uh, that needs a bit of a facelift and probably some new brakes and some other things, a new water pump. We know at least those two things need to be fixed. Um, and we are trying to get some help with that financially. Um, what else are we doing, Christy, that we ought to be mentioning? Um, we just yesterday received another mat matching gift commitment for our digitization project. So um, with everybody's help, if we can raise $300 this weekend, we'll get an additional $300 out of this match. Um, thanks to uh, Clark and a handful of others who have already donated this weekend, we're almost halfway to 300. So, um, just 150 left to go and we'll be able to receive that match. So that would be incredible to do. And that is thanks to Scott Phelps and the Ambulance Science Podcast that um, has just launched on the GEMS Network. So we appreciate their help there. And I feel like there was one more thing that I am- well, let me let me expand on that in terms of digitizing. Yeah. Um, Tom Dick, who we will be speaking with I don't even know when it is, but sometime in the next month or two, I'll be doing one of these sessions with Tom. For those of you that don't know Tom, he is a renowned uh, a cartoonist in EMS and has a number of books of the cartoons he did. And here comes my cat again. No, get out of the way. Shoot. Um, anyhow, he's got a number of books, but he also had a collection of every issue of gems that was ever printed. And he has graciously agreed to donate those to us for preservation. And we are in turn going to have them digitized 
so the researchers can get in there and see what was in wow. the first issue of Gems when Jim Page started the magazine and so on. And where did some of this stuff come from that Clark and myself and some of the others have been talking about over the last couple of months? There's a lot of history uh, incorporated in the pages of those publications. Um, and anytime any of you have anything that you think is of merit from an EMS history standpoint, um, we'd love to get our hands on it because we'd like to see print material digitized. Um, we are in the process of preserving um, already digitized materials such as CDs, DVDs, VHS tapes, etc. I got the uh, Magic of 3 a.m. set in the other day, which is a classic Jim Page uh, presentation. And that was contributed to us by Mary McSwain in New Orleans. So that was terrific. Um, and we've got other stuff coming. In fact, I've got boxes of things here at my house that we need to get centralized <laughs> one of these days. Uh, COVID has kind of slowed us down a little bit in that process. But um, what did I miss, Christy? No, I think that's it. My last thing is um, I want to invite Clark, as well as everybody listening, uh, to our member appreciation party next weekend. Um, if you aren't a member yet, please consider joining the National EMS Museum. Um, should be a fun gathering next Saturday for all of our members and donors and um, reach out if you have any questions. Otherwise, emsmuseum.org backslash support will take you right to the button to push to be a member and we'll um, get those links sent out. My plan is Tuesday if uh, technology works with me this week. We'll get those to everybody right. for the party on Saturday. So sign up and join us. Excellent. Clark. Thank you for the time, my friend. Um, I'm glad we had no technology glitches this afternoon and we actually pulled this off. Um, you are now part of the National EMS Museum video archive, my friend. I appreciate you having me. I, I enjoy being able to share All some right, of the stuff I've gathered over the years and uh, pass it along. Thanks again and do stay in touch with us, please. You take care, be safe and well. Christy, take care. So long. There we go. Thank you, thank you. How'd that go? Okay, we still on? Yeah. Do you have a copy of the book, The House of God in your archives? I can look, but I don't think so. It's, it's, an, it's a classic that has been shared amongst EMS personnel since it was written. And it's, it deals with, um, it's a brand new intern. It, it's a, guy, a physician wrote it under a, under a pen name. But it's a brand new, brand new intern in his first year working in a, uh, in a hospital. And it's full of the terminology you need to know and wacky rules that you go by, like gomers go to ground for old people that always fall and stuff. I used to buy copies of it and give it to the new guys because that's how they learned how hospitals work and how to interface. Yeah. And I'm, it's out of print. I'm going to look for one on Amazon and try to get it to you guys because I bet, I bet the doc knows about it because it was Excellent. a... Yeah, I just, I typed it it's into a, Google. So it's, a, it's, it's a medical classic that every EMS person at one time or another has read a dog-eared copy of sitting in a drawer at their dispatch center. But I love it. That's okay, you take care. Yeah. You be good to yourself, okay? Yeah, you too. And um, speedy recovery. And let's let's try and work out a plan for this. Absolutely. Plan I'll start putting right? stuff together for you. Pictures and uh, some verbiage and my oral histories and things. And uh Maybe we can get a little packet together on that and uh, make it part of the part of the museum. Yeah, that would be amazing. Christy, take care. All right, and awesome. You too. Thank you.